Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on confidently, confidently presenting your qualitative results chapter. My name is Rachel, and I am a senior qualitative research mentor here at Statistics Solutions. I also have ICDs with me today who will be helping me sort of run things behind the scenes um, and in case of any technical difficulties. So thanks for spending this hour with us. Um, during the webinar, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and pop those into the question and answer box and I will leave time at the end to answer any of those questions. Um, if there are questions related to our services here at Statistic Solutions, ICDs will help me answer those as they come in during the webinar. Okay, so again, my name is Rachel. I am a senior qualitative research mentor here at Statistic Solutions. We are a full service uh, dissertation editing and assistance company. So we are here to provide uh, assistance, help, and support to graduate students working on dissertations, people like you. Um, and we are here to help with every stage of the dissertation process from topic development, working on prospectus, all the way through, you know, your final PowerPoint for your final dissertation defense. Um, so you'll see our contact information here. You'll see it throughout the webinar and you'll see it on the final slide of the webinar. Uh, you can self-schedule a complimentary consultation to talk with one of us about your own needs for your own dissertation, areas where you might be struggling and how we can help out. So you can email us. Again, you can, you can, um, get that scheduled yourself. There's a link there. Um, so a couple of ways to find us. And then also on our website, which is likely how you found this webinar, we also have a lot of other great information about writing the dissertation and also more information about how to contact us. So this webinar today is an overview of what a qualitative results chapter should look like. Okay, and so this is the best formula or recipe uh, that I have seen for making sure that you include everything you need to include into that results chapter. So this is a compilation of information and sections that I have seen from the clients that I've worked with over the years of what should be included in this chapter. So if you feel like you're out there floundering as you are writing, you don't know what needs to go into the results chapter, rest assured that if you have the components that we're going to talk about today, you will be in really good shape. Now, these might not all pertain to you. Some schools vary. And, you know, I will use the disclaimer here that you always, always, always want to, to defer to your school department chair, the powers that be for your own institution. Okay. But this should serve as a really good guide to help you draft that results chapter. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Like I said, this is an overview of those sections. And so we'll touch on each of these today, each section and what should go into those sections. So you'll begin with an introduction, just like every other chapter. Okay, here you'll talk a little bit about the setting for your research, participant demographics, how you collected data, how you analyzed data. The bulk of this chapter is the results section. Okay, so at a minimum, this is what needs to be included in the chapter. Okay, and depending on your institution, I know, um, you know, I, I've worked with clients in the past at schools in Europe and in the UK, and they're very different and that the results, that's really the only section that goes into this chapter. Okay, and so that might be you. Again, that's why I say just make sure that you know for your institution what needs to be included. And then you'll include a section on issues of trustworthiness and a summary. 
And again, for anybody coming in late, if you have questions about the content of this presentation, go ahead and pop those into the question and answer box. And I will address those in a designated section at the end of this webinar. Okay, and if there are more general questions about what we do here at Statistic Solutions, you can ask those as well. And I have Isades, who is helping me out behind the scene, field those questions. Okay. So in your introduction, you want to very clearly restate the problem and purpose of your study. If you have been in my other webinars, whoops, excuse me. If you've been in my other webinars, you know that I liken this to holding your reader's hand, okay? There should be absolutely no surprises about what you are doing, what you're talking about in your dissertation. So when you restate the problem and especially the purpose of your study, that is verbatim, literally copied from any chapter that it's mentioned before, you copy that and use it verbatim in your results chapter as well, okay? But you want to remind the reader what your research is about, okay? You've spent the first three, if you're working on a typical sort of five chapter model, you spent the first three sections outlining what it is you're doing. This is where you talk about your results, what you found, okay? So you wanna remind the reader of that. And you wanna remind the readers of your research questions, okay? Your research, must be structured that you identify the problem, you develop the purpose, and you develop the research questions, and then you develop your research design based on those, and then your results follow. Okay, so remind the reader about those and preview the major components of the chapter. Okay, that's your introduction, and then you're done. So then we move into, and again, you know, check to see what your institution requires, um, check to see the order that your institution requires these sections, but there should be a section on the research setting. Okay, think of all of this as providing context for your reader, providing context and background about your study. What does your reader need to know to understand your results. And so I like to think of this as your methods chapter, you set up what you were planning to do or sort of the expectation that you had. And in your results chapter, this is where you talk about how things actually went in the real world because things do change always from what we've planned to do to what actually happens in real life and reality when we're working with human beings and human subjects. So in your setting section, you want to, you know, frame that context, the setting in which your study was conducted, um, any conditions that may have influenced your, your research, your topic, your participants, you as the researcher, anything that may have impacted the interpretation of your results. You talk about all of that here. Okay. So again, it's sort of reiterating what you have developed in your proposal to an extent, but this is also where you get to talk about anything that may have changed from what you proposed in your first chapters to the reality of data collection and analysis. In your demographic section, again, this is a section where you're providing context for understanding the results. So this is where you want to provide information about your participants. And this is really, you know, it depends on your topic, right? What is sort of relevant? What are the relevant characteristics that you would present in terms of demographics? So, you know, it may be important that your reader knows that there are different genders represented, okay? That you didn't maybe work with only women, okay? Um, age ranges might be appropriate. You might be doing some study of, you know, veteran teachers. So it might be important that your reader understands how long teachers have been in their current positions or how long they've been teaching in their careers. 
Okay. So again, it's sort of up to you based on your study, what makes the most sense to present in terms of those relevant characteristics. Sometimes you might find it helpful to present sort of a profile or a sketch of your participants. So in, in more of a narrative form, um, and this can be really helpful to the reader as well. Um, if you are presenting something that goes a little bit, you know, into this greater level of detail about your participants, something like a participant sketch or profile for each participant, um, the main thing that you want to do is still maintain confidentiality. So you don't want to use their real names. You would want to use a pseudonym and, you know, obscure any information that might lead the reader to know who that person is. Okay, so again, if you're if you're working with teachers, maybe you change the name of the school that they work at. Or if you were conducting a study in a very, very small town, you would talk about just the larger geographical region where people live, where your participants live. Demographics are also um, something that are nicely presented in tables. So I often like to do a table to present demographic information. Just make sure that with any tables that you use, um, you're presenting those in narrative format as well. You can't just pop a table in there and expect your reader to understand uh, what the table is about. You still have to describe it at least to some degree. You will include a section on data collection. Okay, so again, this is something that you probably talked about in your methods chapter, but you will revisit in your results chapter to talk about what actually happened. So the number of participants, okay, that participated in data collection, the location where you collected data, the frequency of data collection, you know, did you collect data from one interview with one person? and it took two hours, or did you conduct three interviews with all of your participants? You'll talk about how your data were recorded. Were they audio? Were they visual? Um, did you make notes? Okay, anything like that. Any variations from the plan that you presented in your methods chapter? So again, you know, this is this is sort of the reality of the data collection, the how it actually went. So if you were worried when you were writing your methods chapter, you know, well, what happens if my plans change, which always happens. I see this all the time with my clients. Um, this is where you talk about what happened. Okay. Um, it, it, this happens to everybody, right? Things always change. Anything unusual that happened during data collection. Okay. So really anything that's sort of deviated from the norm, anything that was different from what you proposed in your methods chapter, but you talk in detail about the data collection, who you collected it from, where you collected it, um, you know, the types of data you collected. So another section that is going to look similar to something that you drafted in your methods chapter is the data analysis section. And this is where you have the opportunity to talk about how you applied your plan for data analysis, which is what you outlined in your methods chapter, how you used that to analyze your own data, how you applied that plan to your data. So you talk about your data analysis specifically in the context of your own data. Okay. Now, if there's one section where I see it kind of vary from, does it go in the methods chapter? Or does it go in the results chapter or both? This is that section. I have seen schools that want the entire discussion of how data were analyzed in the methods chapter. So again, make sure that you're checking with your own institution, your chair, reviewer, um, department, you know, to make sure that you are on track to get this in the right place. Okay. So 
in this section, if you are including it in your results chapter, you want to describe how you analyzed each source of data. So if you had interviews, did you conduct a thematic analysis? Did you conduct an interpretative phenomenological analysis? And how specifically did you do that? Okay, how did you do that for your own data? What were some of the codes? How did you move from the codes to the categories or the themes or the superordinate themes? Okay, this is where you get into the fine detail. This is where you talk about, um, you know, describing, defining the codes, the categories, the themes that you identified in data analysis. And importantly, this section is also where you want to talk about how you handled discrepant or negative cases, where they fit into your analysis. Okay, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. But discrepant cases are those cases that don't seem to fit the general pattern of the rest of the data. And we need to figure out what to do with that when analyzing the data. And so in this section, you talk about how you handled those discrepant cases, those cases that seem to tell you something different than the patterns in your data. We're telling you. So the presentation of your results, as I said, is really the bulk of this chapter. Okay. This is the big, what did you find? Okay. So at a minimum, like I said, this is what goes into your results chapter. There are different ways that you can organize your results. And there are not hard and fast rules for this, okay? So the best I can do is give the guidance that however you present them needs to make sense for your own study, okay? So, you might consider organizing your results based on your research questions. So let's say you have four research questions, then let's say within those four, you present the categories that address research question one, and then the categories that address research question two. So you're organizing them with like sort of the top level of the hierarchy is the research question, but it may be more appropriate to organize your results by category or theme, okay, by the pattern itself. If you conducted a thematic analysis, this might make more sense. If you conducted an interpretative phenomenological analysis, this might make more sense as well. Okay, so again, it really just depends on what makes the most sense for your study in the context of your study. But there are different ways that you can present the results. So don't think that you have to adhere to one or that you're locked into presenting it in just one way. Okay, there are a lot of possibilities. So in qualitative results chapters, there's, there's gonna be a lot of words, okay? These aren't quantitative, there aren't the numbers, there aren't all of the pretty tables that, I don't know if you're like me, but you see the tables and you just kind of keep scrolling because not really into the hard data, the, the quantitative data. Um, so, you know, I tend to, that goes over my head. Um, it's narrative in qualitative data analysis, okay? Um, and so most of it should be your own words and your own writing, but you're, you're building a case for the themes, for the patterns. And so your assertions, okay, your own words should be supported by quotes from participants, right? You want to show evidence that this pattern exists in your data or these patterns exist in your data. So using supporting quotes, using excerpts from participant interviews, from documents, if you conducted a document analysis, um, perhaps you conducted observations and took photographs. You might include photographs in there as well. But the bulk of it is going to be written 
in your own words. Okay. The bulk of it is narrative. So you want to discuss your data, what you found. And here I have and interpret if appropriate. Now, the interpretation of the data is more often left for the discussion in your discussion chapter. When you talk about it, you discuss it, you interpret it in the context of the other literature. Okay. But there are certain types of data analysis specifically interpretative phenomenological analysis, which as you might imagine, does include an interpretive component in the results chapter. And so just make sure that, you know, you are adhering ultimately to the design that you have established for your study. Okay. So it may include some interpretive component when you discuss your data. And again, as a reminder at this point, your patterns, your, your, whatever the presentation is, whatever the organization is, it should be logical. It should be very clear to the reader. Remember, we don't want any surprises. This is not the time for that. Okay. Think about holding your reader's hand. Okay. Walking them through all the way from chapter one to here, now we have the results chapter and it should all make sense and it should all flow and be clear and logical to them. So I said that I would return to this issue of discrepant cases or negative cases. And again, this is where something in our data doesn't fit the overall pattern, okay? And this happens all the time. It's very common. So if you are finding something like this in your data, that's totally normal and okay. Um, but, you know, so it may be that you have developed these nice categories based on patterns and you have four different categories or we'll call them themes. Okay. And maybe you had 12 participants and 11 participants all experienced some event in the same way. They all described it as, as a really positive experience. They had a really good time. They had a lot of fun. And you have a 12th participant who really hated it. What do you do with that? Okay. Well, we can't just cast it aside. We can't throw it out. That's not how this works. Okay. Because that does tell us something, right? We know that people who have gone to this event, you know, in general seem to really have a positive attitude toward it, but someone didn't. So this helps illustrate the variation in experience. Okay. It may allow us to generate alternate explanations. Okay. We might dig a little bit deeper to find out why this person didn't enjoy this event when everyone else did. Okay. But we want to account for it. And it's a good idea to talk about it when we present our results. And so I think the, the clearest way to do this is to discuss these discrepant cases at the level of that category. So if it is the level of the theme, then you would talk about it within that theme. If you have sub themes or subcategories, you might talk about it at that level as well, because it's not generally the case that you would have one participant who in every possible way varied from all of the other participants. That might be the case, but it probably isn't. And so you, at a, at a deeper level, the level of the category, that's where you talk about where there, where the variations exist, where the negative or discrepant cases exist. Now I said that most of this is going to be a narrative form. Your results are going to be a narrative form. Okay. Um, and this is, this is true. We're, we're working with textual data, qualitative data. 
Okay. But there are also ways to visualize findings and one or more of these might be appropriate for your own dissertation. So again, like I said, you might use tables, right? Think about demographics and how those can be really handy. Demographic tables can be really handy um, for presenting, you know, just a really quick overview of, okay, you know, we have this many um, men and women in your study and this many of the men have been teachers for 20 plus years, you know, and so you just get a table in there that a reader could skim over. Okay. That's great. You might use a figure as well. Um, things like maps can be helpful. This might be a map of a geographical region. If that is important for understanding the context of your study, perhaps you did something with classroom observations and you drew maps of the classroom and it is appropriate to include that in this chapter. Maybe you had students draw you maps of their classroom, okay, and what they like best about it, you know, and maybe that's something that you want to include. Um, if you're doing something related to, say, social network analysis and you include that kind of map, you know, mapping social networks, that might also be something that's appropriate to include in your results chapter. So there are a lot of ways to visualize the findings. Okay. Just think about, you know, you do want to use them somewhat sparingly. Okay. They need to really be used to illustrate a point. You don't want so many that they kind of detract from what you are, the points that you're trying to make. Okay. And again, just as another good reminder, Anytime you include something like this table, figure, map, drawing, you also need to describe it in narrative form in the text. Doesn't necessarily require a ton of detail, but you need to provide sufficient detail so the reader can understand whatever that visual is that you have included. You will also very likely include a section on issues of trustworthiness. And this is also something that you've probably included in your methods chapter. So this is, again, where you have the opportunity to talk about the what you did compared to what you planned to do from your methods chapter. And so issues of trustworthiness and qualitative research include credibility, transferability, dependability, and confirmability. And so they have to do with things like how confident are we in the accuracy of the findings, that the findings were based on what participants said, thought, believed, as opposed to what the researcher said, thought, believed. Um, you know, that, that results are replicable, that they can be applied to other contexts. So there are different ways to establish these. And the way that I have this written up here makes it sort of appear as though these are mutually exclusive and they're absolutely not. Um, triangulation is a really common method of establishing trust, trustworthiness, um, can be used for um, any of these four, not just credibility and triangulation is, you know, things like when we use multiple data sources, it doesn't mean three, even though it's got that, you know, try in there. Um, it could just be two data sources, um, you know, so different ways of doing this, but this is where you want to describe exactly how you establish trustworthiness in your data. And then finally, you will include a summary, okay? Um, again, like with your other chapters, and it's fairly formulaic, you want to highlight your findings and sort of sketch out an overall picture and reminder of your key results and insights that you found in your study, and then transition to the next chapter, which is probably your discussion chapter. So this is maybe my favorite part of the webinar because we have talked about all of the different sections that 
you will likely include all or most of in your results chapter. And perhaps that is why you came to this webinar today, because you needed a guide for those different sections. Okay. But maybe your question was a little bit more existential. What do I do with this results chapter? How do I even start? Okay. So this section is for you. Okay. Um, the results chapter is very different from what you've written before. Okay. Um, for a number of reasons, but one thing that makes this chapter challenging is that oftentimes there is very big gap in time from when we wrote our proposal and when we started writing our results. Okay. Um, maybe it's only six months for some of you. For some of us, it's closer to many years. Okay. You can raise your hand. I am. I'm not ashamed. Um, there, there were, there were years that passed between when I wrote my proposal and when I wrote my results chapter. And I, you know, was in a bit of a different program. I am an anthropologist by training. We do field work. I was in the field for a very long time and time just has a way of slipping by, doesn't it? Um, so for those of us sort of returning to write the results after we've collected data, we're out of the habit of reading and writing. You know, remember when you were writing your proposal and you were so immersed in what you were doing all the time, we were reading and writing and thinking, and that's all that we did all the time was reading and writing and thinking about our topic, about our study, about school, about, you know, all of it. Um, and the longer we go from being in that habit, you know, the harder it is to get back into it. So the results chapter kind of sneaks up and then all of a sudden you have to get back into it. So these are my tips for the, where do I start? Okay. The first thing is you are the boss of you and you don't have to start writing at the beginning. Okay. In fact, I personally find that returning to draft a chapter introduction and a chapter summary after I have drafted a chapter to be more effective. Because I don't know what I'm going to put in that chapter necessarily. You know, it could end up being something totally different from what I envisioned ahead of time. Okay. So you don't have to start with the introduction. Now you might work differently than me. Okay. Um, you might be someone who needs that kind of sketch of the chapter. And if so, then great, start with the introduction. But my point is there's no one telling you where you have to start. Okay. You get to decide. So you don't have to start at the beginning. Um, this I think is very challenging for a lot of us who have, shall we say, perfectionist tendencies, those of us who might be pursuing dissertations, advanced degrees. Um, and, you know, I know the tendency is there to start with the first word and you want everything to come out perfectly the first time. And I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that. First, you make a mess and then you clean it up. Okay. So get over the perfectionism. Don't start at the beginning. You might be so overwhelmed right now that you can't even think about your big results, your big key findings. That's totally okay too, right? So there's work that I like to call TV work, sort of the brainless work. Remember how I said that you'll probably provide some visualizations, maybe some tables, maybe some maps in your results chapter? What if one evening while you are watching television with your family and you've got a sitcom going or whatever you're binging on Netflix. And you just say, you know what, I think I'm just going to put together a table of my participants demographic information. It's, it doesn't take a lot of thought. You can do it with TV in the background, but 
this is the low hanging fruit. You're still getting something done. You are still doing something productive that moves you to the mountain. That's the goal. Okay. And eventually it kind of becomes that snowball, right? Because you're getting more and more done. Even if it doesn't seem like it, you would still have to make that table later on anyway. Right. So if you're not feeling up for drafting a whole theme, if it just feels really overwhelming, make a table. That's totally fine. Go for the low hanging fruit. Alternatively, if you are feeling awesome, you're super excited about your results. Um, you're really excited. You've got some great ideas for how to present your themes or your categories. Um, you know exactly what you want to talk about it. Dive in. That's perfectly okay too. You can start big. Um, you know, that motivation doesn't come out of nowhere and it's not just going to come to you. So if you're waiting around for the motivation, stop. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Sadly, unfortunately, um, but you can harness it. You can go get it. Okay. So start small or big, right? Depending on how you feel, just do something. Something will get you there. A lot of some things will get you there. Okay. This is why I talk also about free writing and brainstorming. One thing that I found really, really helpful was when I was writing my my qualifying exams. And then also when I was writing my results, um, I dedicated 15 minutes each morning to free writing and brainstorming. And for me, it worked really well to do this on a computer because I'm a fast typer, but this may not be the case for you. For you, it might be, you know, you work best with a notebook and a pen and that's awesome too, whatever works for you. But I, I did have the benefit of an office space so I could go in and close the door. But if there's anywhere private that you can get that you can sit down for 15 minutes and just free write on your topic, on your results, your findings, your ideas about them, do not underestimate how much 15 minutes can add up. Okay. But here's the kicker. You can't censor yourself. Okay. This is true free writing. Let spell check go. Let grammar check go. Don't worry about it. First, you make a mess, then you clean it up. Okay. But you can write pages and pages and pages in 15 minutes. I promise. And some of them will be garbage and you will throw them out. And that is fine. Okay. But what if you get one or two like gold nuggets out of each of those sections? Okay. And you can build on those when you are again, feeling really good and fresh and ready to sit down and write. Okay. So to recap, you don't have to start at the beginning. You're the boss of you start with what you're comfortable with. If it is something small, do that. If you're ready to tackle bigger sections, do that. Okay. Um, there are a lot of ways to attack this, but it doesn't have to be from your introduction all the way through to summary. Okay. And take advantage of free writing or brainstorming and just let yourself, you know, writing is thinking on paper or on a computer screen. Always remember that. Okay. So you can really get a lot done if you do this. Now, if you're still stuck, that's why we're here. Okay. Again, for those who came in late, my name is Rachel and I'm a senior qualitative research mentor here at Statistic Solutions. Okay. We provide full service dissertation consulting to graduate students like yourselves to help you get through this process in a timely manner. Okay. Because we've done it too. So we know, we know where you are. We know where you're coming from. We offer a complimentary consultation. Okay. And so you can schedule that um, on our website. There is a link. You can email us at info at statisticsolutions.com. You can give us a call to get scheduled to talk to one of us about how we can help. 
where you're at in the process, what you need help with, how we can tailor our services to best support you and get you to your goal, which is getting done, right? So you will receive a copy of this webinar uh, tomorrow, I believe, and also the slide deck as well, so that you can refer to it. On our website, we have a host of other awesome information that is available to you. So it's statisticsolutions.com. We have just um, really upgraded and expanded our website too. So it's very user-friendly. You can find any resources you could possibly need on qualitative research, quantitative research, topic development, um, tips on writing and motivation and, um, you know, really anything that you could possibly want. And also links to our other webinars because we do provide other webinars as well. So this is the confidently presenting your qualitative results chapter. I host another webinar on qualitative methods. We have webinars on quantitative methods. We have webinars on discussion chapters, literature reviews, all of that. And so you can find all of that on our website. So as promised, we do have a little bit of time left for question and answers. So if you do have questions, again, go ahead and pop those into the question and answer section. And I will read each of the questions out loud and answer those for people. So again, go ahead and pop any questions that you have into the question and answer box. I will get those read aloud and answered. Do you have a question on um, just starting to think about topics, any advice on how to proceed? Yeah, if you're thinking about topics, the best thing that you can do is start to dig into the research that's available, um, you know, see what is out there in terms of your topic, what you're most interested in, see what people have done before, see where other researchers have sort of pointed to in terms of new avenues, new directions for research. Um, I have a question about APA expectation for visual inclusion. So tables, figures, maps, drawings. Um, I'm not exactly sure if you're if you're talking about formatting or not, because there are specific APA requirements for formatting, but sort of their overall um, sort of statement on visual inclusions is to use them sparingly and only when appropriate. So they really need to convey information that is important to sort of be conveyed visually. So if you're just starting the dissertation process, the question is, do we need to start at the beginning or should we start in places we feel most comfortable? If you're just beginning the dissertation process, this is where you need to start digging into the research because um, you know, I, I, so some of it is going to depend on what your chair wants to see. Some chairs want to see chapter one, your introductory chapter first, and um, some chairs, you know, prefer to see like your literature review, um, <clears throat> literature review and, and methods first. So that would be a starting point, but really, if you're just starting out, my best advice is to dig into the research related to your topic. Um, that'll help you start thinking about your literature review, and it'll also start to sort of get you refining your topic and your research problem and purpose.
is there a feasible approach to conducting qualitative grounded theory for a dissertation? Um, there is, I generally, um, it's, it, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of time. Um, and, you know, in some disciplines, you know, grounded theory absolutely makes sense. Um, and in others, it doesn't necessarily. So if you have the time and thus the money, right, because the time turns into money when we're um, paying for credits, et cetera, um, then, you know, and then certainly, you know, I would say consider grounded theory, you know, based on your topic. But ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, I think ultimately, you know, any qualitative approach is certainly feasible. Um, but it will need to, the design will need to come from your topic. We, um, I have a question about content analysis resources for the results section. Um, we do have some on our webpage um, for help with qualitative research. A question on, um, I haven't started data collection yet, but I am considering changing my participation numbers. Um, my methodology in chapter one have already been approved by my chair. Should I wait and make those changes in this chapter? Um, okay, so. Here's what I found. Kind of. <laughs> Um, if you need to change participation numbers, I don't think that that's necessarily a problem. But you should be able to justify this based on the literature. Um, I would probably recommend the first thing would be talking to your chair, though, um, and just making sure that it's, you know, kosher to change your numbers, um, making sure that that's all right. And you'll probably go back and tweak this in your methods chapter. But again, first thing to do would be to talk to your chair. Um, I have a question on how do we actually decide uh, which method to use, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods? So this is really one... Um, the sort of best and only advice I can give you is it has to do with your research problem, your purpose, and your research questions. Everything has to come from those, the flow, the alignment. So whatever your identified problem is, whatever your purpose statement says, whatever your research questions are about, um, then you need to think about what makes sense, what kind of data do you need to collect to understand all of that. And so that's where you can sort of get into um, differences in design. Um, resources for understanding some of the different qualitative approaches that I've mentioned. Yes. So absolutely check out our website and our blog on different qualitative data analysis approaches, qualitative research designs, but there are some other sort of um, you know, good kind of basic qualitative research handbooks out there um, that you can just, I mean, really just Google John Cresswell comes to mind. Um, but, you know, Googling any qualitative methods, qualitative research textbooks would get you sort of a good overview or jumping off point for um, any of the different designs. Are there other questions that I can answer this afternoon? Okay, so again, everyone will receive a copy 
of the webinar and the slides from this webinar. I believe that will be going out tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Happy writing. Remember to start small if you need to, or big if you need to. Okay. Um, and take care and good luck.